So I, I down like twice on the Fenrir and go to hit it. And he goes, hold, hold on. There's speed cameras like every kilometer in Dubai. Back when, when the opportunity came up for Genius Garage to do the Lycan Hypersport build from the Fast and the Furious stunt car, it was exciting. And obviously we wanted to take it on because this is a Fast and the Furious car of something that had exist but was basically mythological at that point. And frankly, I had virtually zero familiarity with what the Lycan Hypersport was. I remember talking with a buddy a million years ago in a podcast and he was really into it. And I'm like, what? what? I don't even know what this is. Of course, in building that, it was exciting, but we didn't really know what a Lycan Hypersport truly was. We only had the numbers, the things that were reported on to go by and the few pictures. And kind of picking apart what you know what they maybe started with, how they engineered it, and what it could be. So you can kind of fill in the frog DNA from Jurassic Park, so to speak. And in building the Genius Garage car over the last year, we did the best job we could to figure it out. And it was also interesting because along the way, when we had the so-called, the parts of the dinosaur DNA that we got out of the amber, so to speak, and not the frog DNA, it would solve mysteries. And based on what we know, that there was Porsche involvement or roof involvement with the original Lycan, uh, which is a fantastic platform to build something from and upon, we started to figure more out. But even throughout that process and building a car, it was still unknown. But it's exciting because in recent, um, started to have just a little bit of a relationship with W Motors because we were really happy and honored that they actually reached out to Genius Garage and myself while we were doing this build, which was exciting because that's not what you normally expect from a car company to be positive and just seeing what's going on and kind of offer support. So moving down the line, I got the invite from the CEO to actually be able to go to Dubai and test drive the cars. So as a car guy, how do I not go? Now that being said, my wife and I both decided to go. And frankly, we went on our own dollar because I didn't want a sponsor. I didn't want anybody telling me what to do or how to present something. I just wanted to go as Casey Putch, the car guy. My wife and I, we booked the flights and traveled to Dubai. We got an Airbnb, stayed in the Marina District, and we had no idea what we were doing other than these are the days we're gonna spend with W Motors. We're gonna check it out. We're gonna meet Ralph Daba. We're gonna meet the people there. We're gonna drive the cars on multiple days. I found some other fun things to do, a vintage Formula One race at the Dubai Autodrome that Friday night. So there's plenty to group into this to make it a really fun vacation for my wife and kind of the automotive Indiana Jones to go see if the unicorn is real or uh, if it's all it's cracked up to be in legend. Had the opportunity to tour the facility. I'm uh, gonna talk about that at a later time. And of course the Fenrir, but this story is about the Lycan and driving it. And I had two days to drive the Lycan. So the first day I was at W Motors, met Ralph, met the people, and they're all very real. That was nice for me because, of course, when you see you know, how people are portrayed, whether it's anything from an article to video to a documentary, you see one side of it. But when you meet them for real and you actually go there, you, you get to meet them as people and, and see what it's really about. And it was kind of nice because it was disarming initially because... They're people. <laughs> They're people that build cars that run a business and do that. I didn't get any sense of pretenses or being put on. I've never heard this run. Yeah. That first day, met Ralph, toured the facilities, checked it all out, and was seeing the cars. And you know, there it was. It was sitting with the doors open, the, the hood, the front, the front, the hood. You know, everything was open and looking at it. So I was kind of starting to look at it, nitpick, and you know, the first thing the bare carbon that's exposed under where it's painted, the underside of the, the trunk and the hood and parts of the doors and uh, in and around the trunk was all super high quality. The fit and the finish and the engineering was tight. It was right. I was starting to kind of like poke on things and wiggle door, try to, you know, and wiggle the hood and all. And it was all built well. It partially bridged the gap between what I would come to see of a production supercar or hypercar, but also of a high level racing car. It was done very well. It was things that I would see reflected in, you know, IndyCar racing or uh, LMP or Daytona prototypes, stuff like that, but done in a way that would be not just a single prototype in racing, but they were going to make a line of these cars. So everything that I saw with regard to the engineering was executed well. But uh, of course, we we're going to drive it. So that, you know, comes into play. The other thing aspect of it is in sitting in the interior, that's a place where you figure you're going to be able to pick a car apart. 
and really the, the only thing I could critique, which isn't even fair to do a critique, is if you're a, over six foot one, you're gonna have a hard time fitting. I come in right about six foot, six foot one, and kind of have Dutch proportions, long legs and such, and it was perfectly fine. I was situated, I was comfortable, I'd get to the shifter well, and the handbrake, and the pedals, and all the fit and finish was nice. There was nothing rattle. Everything was solid and, and well done of the materials and craftsmanship and execution. The gauges were laid out nice. It does, in fact, have the holographic interactive dash, which uh, is cool. It's not as instantaneously usable as would be buttons or something like that, but it, it's it's for real. It does work. You can operate radio, climate control, et cetera, through hologram, which is really neat. But honestly, I wasn't even into that. I was just into it as a car. The other thing about the Lycan Hypersport that I don't think all of us fully well realize, it's got three pedals. It's not just a two pedal car, it's got a clutch. And the shifter is a sequential shifter. And what's fascinating about that, so three pedal car with a clutch, and it's got a sinker mesh gearbox, but it's sequentially shifted. So you pull back to upshift, push forward to downshift, and then there's a reverse lockout button if you want to engage reverse which is actually really cool. And that was when they built the Lycan, the best gearbox they could have really to handle the kind of power you're making from twin turbo at the time, which also I was very interested to see how the car would actually drive. Is it really making this kind of power? And is it actually gonna be a decent driving car? Or is it just, you know, this is a pretty nice thing that sits here that works. It was a little weird though, because it's different. Not because there's anything amiss, but for me, all the vehicles I've driven that are sequential shifted have a straight like dog engagement like a race car. And they may be three pedal or have a hand clutch, but I've never driven a car that's three pedal and synchro mesh. So I had to kind of try to program my brain for it. It was different, it was cool. And I say that and bring that up because I didn't want to lose sight of the fact that I am 7,400 miles away from home. I am in a whole nother part of the world I never expected to be in. I am the most amount of uh, time zones far away. And these people who were nice enough to have me here and then trust me not to ruin their stuff are going to let me drive their stuff. They sold these things for three and a half million dollars, which is relevant, but it's not. It's still their prototype. It's still a lot of work and you know, just kind of respecting them as people and business people. I don't wanna mess it up because then they or we are gonna to have to fix it. That first day, we're gonna go out to a section that's just outside of Dubai where they're gonna be developing it, but it's, people like to take a lot of photos for Instagram and such. It's in the desert, there's some nice straight sections. So we can drive around, get good footage of it. I can get used to the car because the next day we're gonna take it to the mountains and really rip it up. So it's my opportunity to get used to it, get to know the guys. We'll also have the Fenrir out. So we're gonna head out and their head engineer guy is gonna drive it. I'm gonna ride in it first just to talk to him and kind of get the vibe. Friend of mine's riding in the Fenrir with their relationship manager who's driving it, and it was darn cool. I mean, hearing the cold start, it's firing up, it's becoming a real car. Okay, I get in it, shutting the door. It's a real car, we're getting in it, we're driving it. The relationship manager who's driving the Fenrir has a shaved head, so he's kind of got like a Dom Toretto thing going on in it, and he's, and then he's saying funny things to me, and I'm like, I can't even do lines from Fast and the Furious because I, I don't know what's happening here. It was kind of a fun moment. Anyway, we went out to this uh, new development, and there's lots of people out there. It's where car guys go. Ford GT is something in a hurricane. There's a lot of uh, native Emirati guys with their like all-wheel drive crazy Nissans that are ripping out in the desert, you know, and we're uh, driving along, avoiding, you know, sand drifts and such. We're getting on a little bit. I'm like, okay, we're kind of getting at it. This is pretty cool. Getting used to driving it, getting used to nature, how the clutch engages and all that, and it was fun. So we shot some good video, switched cars, got to drive the Fenrir that night. And, uh, and then I actually drove the Fenrir home, or back to uh, W Motors, which was also a little bit funny because right when we got on the highway, he's like, okay, we can go. And I was like, all right, let's go. So I, I downshift like twice on the Fenrir and go to hit it. And he goes, hold, hold on. There's speed cameras like every kilometer in Dubai. I'm like, Ugh, how do we have fun? He's like, don't worry about that, we'll have fun. <laughs> the car initially was, there was no rattles. There was nothing weird. We're out in the desert, sitting there idling. Now, obviously it's cooler we're in the, in the winter, but it's, it's not cold. <laughs> uh, I was sitting there idling for a long time. Nothing overheated. Nothing did anything weird. There's no rattles. It ran well. There were no hiccups. It shifted well. The pedals were great. And the only thing I can criticize is I'm kind of on the tall side for the car and to toe heel downshift, the brake pedal was a little higher than I'd like to see from the gas pedal. But those aren't really criticism worth bringing up. That's just the way it was. And I could adjust the brake pedal if I really wanted to or it was my car. And honestly, I just kind of enjoyed being out in what is the Arabian or Emirati desert. It was beautiful to see and it was surreal with the cars and it 
it just worked. It was frankly nice to be there, real cars. So day two were, was going to the Jebel Jays Mountain on this road, which I didn't really know what that was yet, but Mount Rose sounded cool. But anyway, we go meet in a place and it's a gravel kind of parking lot area. And I can see that there's two transport covered vehicles that presumably have the Lycan and Fenrir in it. The person that does development driving for them and some track driving is uh, Oliver Webb, a uh, talented racing driver, raced a whole lot of stuff from England. Uh, and he was there. So he was gonna ride along with me in the Lycan to start off with. And my buddy was gonna ride in the Fenrir and we're gonna go up this mountain. Now the Jebel J Road apparently was built to be the driveway for a sheikh that was gonna build his palace on top of the mountain. And then as story goes, he decided not to build his palace there, but the road was already built. So now there's a restaurant at the top and a zip line of all things. Hop in the, the Lycan, get my cameras and everything ready, and I've got a mic on and all this, and I'm driving the car again, so Gareth just, just goes ripping off in the Fenrir, and I'm like, okay, well, here we go. Which normally I love, but I'm like, hey guys, trying to be respectful here, and you know, since I've been in a foreign land in Dubai, I've been, mindful about being respectful of cultures and rules and everything like that. I wasn't necessarily thinking, let's just go ripping off like I do in my Dodge Viper back home, but okay, here we go. It was very beautiful, it was gently winding until we got to the point where it's like switchbacks and just like a wicked hill climb. Being mindful to kind of talk and narrate because I wanted to film this and you know, Oliver's here, we're having conversation about the car and I'm getting used to it more because now I'm driving the car even harder than I was the night before. And yes, I was using full throttle a good number of times. And uh, it was nice because there was a lot of lanes to use and such. But at the same time, too, I'm, I'm looking at the scenery going, oh, my God, this is so beautiful. Wait, don't wreck. You know, and like I was trying to balance not being like a, a starry eyed tourist. So we're driving along and quick enough that where there would be sometimes a little bit of blowing sand across the road, you'd, you'd feel a loss of traction like that. You know, we're obviously um, pushing the car reasonably and I trust the car well because it's giving me all the feedback of something that's a well-prepared platform, excellent brakes, well-built, well-presented, not doing anything strange, but at the same time, there's still a certain amount of self-preservation. And with it being three pedals and me kind of crammed in it since I'm tall in the sequential box, I'm being mindful of being nice to the machinery. And one of the little things for me getting used to it was because it's so boosted in terms of turbo and making that kind of power, I had to change my timing on the clutch and throttle like I would from a naturally aspirated engine with a real like small flywheel because if I wanted to let off like that, there'd be enough boost that it'd kind of rev a little bit past each time. So I had to change the timing, but it was cool. We're ripping along and there's clouds rolling. We're getting high enough. We're diving into the clouds and it looks like when I was a kid playing Need for Speed video games on the computer in some like, you know, fictitious, beautiful mountain place, except we're doing this in real life. So we go up the mountain, we're almost there, and we pull off and check it out. And I look back and the car was smoking. And they were mentioning, well, there might be some oil getting on the turbos or exhaust. And I'm, I'm like, hold on, I got this. Because the people with me were not the engineers. So I'm looking at the car, I'm looking it over, and I'm like, I don't see any oil. I'm like, and the, the wing is operated hydraulically. So I thought maybe a line or something could be loose like that. And it wasn't anything that worried me too much, but obviously I wanna be respectful of the car. It's a prototype. It's kind of like halfway between a production hypercar and a race car. So I'm just kind of going in a race mode like I would in the pits. And I looked at it and there was a heat shield, this aluminum, with insulated material and the reflective for radiant heat, just like you would in race cars, IndyCar F1. And it was laying on the muffler. And I noticed that, I'm like, hey guys, and I was starting to look at seeing what I could MacGyver on this <laughs> mountain hillside just to hold it because I was certain that was probably what was going on. So anyway, the car was good. It was just a little bit. And so we make the last little bit trek up to the restaurant and get to this checkpoint like up by the border of Oman. I'm not sure if we were on the border or not, but we get there and it was almost kind of scary because I'll be frank, I'm kind of afraid of heights <laughs> because that's an easy way to kill yourself or at least my inner brain is thinking that. <laughs> We're, we're like pointing right up and these beautiful clouds are there and I see nothing but sheer and I'm like, <laughs> we're in the sky. So we arrive at the restaurant. I check out the car and the heat shield I was actually able to unfix and I looked at it and I was able to just slide it out and I go, you know what, honestly guys, I know it sounds silly, but we don't need this because there's nothing here that needs to be protected from the heat of the muffler. So let's just remove that. And I was like, yeah, you guys, this is, this is where it was singeing. So that's what the little bit of smoke was, which, you know, it's the prototype car. They had just repainted it and did some restoration work. So I think somebody might have missed that, but really can't take much away from it. It's just just a little bit. But it was kind of fun because I feel like I'm sort of working on a race car like I normally do. But 
the personality of the Lycan really came through to me. Obviously, I think a lot of people know I'm, I love my old Dodge Vipers because they're raw and early. They're kind of, in a way, have a similar personality to the Lycan. Lycan's more sophisticated and a nicer build than my Vipers. But what I mean to say is the Dodge Viper way back when, the reason I like it so much is it was kind of between that production exotic car from long ago and that one-off racing car. And the Lycan was just that, but just at a much higher level. It's mid-engine, it's twin turbo, makes a lot of power, has excellent brakes, but it's still three pedals. I still have to toe heel downshift it and go into sequential. And the sequential feels like a, a racing gearbox, like what I'm accustomed to in a Champ car, or a, you know, Can-Am car, something of the like. So the personality came through because you actually have to have a brain to drive it well. And you can drive it fast. You can drive it pushing the limit like that and come out well. You know, if, it was, if I was going to set it up specifically for a track, I might set it up to get rid of a little bit of understeer, but it was set up perfect for doing a myriad of things and giving you confidence to do it. And we just had a great time ripping down. But it, I liked the, lot, the Lycan because it was still a beast. It was sophisticated. It was exotic. It was expensive. It was an absolute unicorn, but it has a beastly soul that took some effort and thinking to drive and rewarded you for doing it well, which feels really cliche to use that word because I'm pretty sure well, that's what they said in that Fast and the Furious thing, unleash the beast, <laughs> which is so hokey, but it is a beast. And for those two days, and especially that one day on that mountain, far away from home, yeah, we let the beast rip and let it off the chain. And it was awesome. Experiencing the real Lycan Hypersport uh, obviously was a great experience finding out that the Unicorn is indeed a real car. But there was another effect that I didn't realize was that obviously me with the Students and Genius graduate, we had concentrated so hard of taking a uh, stunt car shell and making it into a car as best that we could using the Porsche Boxster, which frankly pales into comparison to what the real Lycan Hypersport is. But I will tell you this, getting the experience, all that at W Motors in the real car actually gave me a lot more appreciation for what the Genius Garage students and I were able to accomplish in that one year. And one of those little things were the people at W Motors had been watching the videos and they knew the students by name and would bring up like going on like the student who did the headlights and taillights they were super impressed with. And they talked about all the different students as they would somebody they would potentially hire. So I, I kind of appreciated more what we had done and what we had built. It kind of raised the stakes, or in a sense of it inspired me more to really finish it off well. Autotempest.com is the fastest and most powerful way to shop for your next car. They compile the results from all the major listing sites into one place. In fact, they just added another one, Facebook Marketplace. Just like they've always let you do with Craigslist, now you can search Facebook Marketplace nationally at the same time. No more typing in cities and adding your search radius and all that stuff. They put all the results into one place and I love them for that. We appreciate their support of VinWiki and CarTrek and everything that we do here, but honestly, it's where I start most of my mornings looking for whatever's gonna fill the next garage spot here. So check them out now at the link in the description below to find your next car. Autotempest.com, all the cars, one search.